Thank you all so much for being here. I very much appreciate it. Um, so my name is Drew Philp. I went to school here at U of M. Um, I come from a pretty blue collar family, um, and I felt really lucky to get the education that I did. Um, so when school was over, um, this was in uh, 2008, uh, I saw so many people leaving the state that I wanted to stay here. And I thought that I got this world class education and I wanted to use it at home for something good, uh, however na naive that, that may have been at the time. Um, so I moved to Detroit uh, because I thought that was where I could have the biggest impact. So what I uh, were to do in Detroit would affect my cousin uh, in Kalamazoo framing out houses or my sister in Lansing uh, who's a nurse. Um, and when I was there, uh, it was this was like the, the market crash, and I decided to buy a house uh, because I wanted to keep myself there. Um, because so many people had told me, you know, what are you, what are you doing here? You're throwing your life away um, being here. And uh, everyone leaves. Everyone, uh, you know, like sometimes people come, and every, this is the, the, the place of leaving, and it's the city of leaving. Um, over the last decade, I believe one in four elementary school age children has left um, the city. Obviously, the city has built, been built for almost three times the amount of people that live there now. Um, so buying a house was a way to keep myself there. Um, if I had a house, I couldn't just leave. Um, at the time, there was no way to rent it out. Um, so I, in 2009, I purchased uh, an abandoned house uh, for $500. It was filled with trash. Um, 10,000 pounds of trash I took out of just the first floor. Um, I took out the better part of a Dodge Caravan, um, cut into pieces with a reciprocating saw in my house. Um, needles, uh, human shit, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, the house had no windows, no plumbing, no electricity, uh, and had a pornographic hole in the uh, roof. Um, so I fixed that up with my own hands. Um, uh, and and I live I live there now. Um, so over the last almost the last decade, I purchased the house in 2009, um, and I wrote about the experience uh, in this book. Uh, the house is uh, just a spine uh, for the book, a, a kind of way to get people through the narrative um, to really talk about some of the social issues that are going on in Detroit and to a larger extent uh, the United States. If you haven't read the book yet, I, I hope you all get a chance to because he touches on things, a, a myriad of issues ranging from uh, policing to consumerism uh, to, you know, all of those topics in Detroit, but also uh, I think your quote is, uh, Detroit is America just with the volume turned all the way up. Uh, so you, you have these very American stories, but it's amplified because it's happening in Detroit. Uh, and one of the things you do in the book is you make a very conscious choice uh, about how you're going to build the house. and you know, you want to build it yourself, you want to use materials that are sourced a certain way. Um, I guess, what did that decision process look like in terms of what drove you to make those decisions on what you put into the house and how long did it take you to accumulate all those things when you were building it? So that decision uh, came out of just general stubbornness a lot. I wanted to work for all the money that went in, th all the money that went in the house. I didn't feel like I wanted to take out a mortgage, for example, and uh, you know pay someone already rich uh, interest um, to um, be able to do that. I wanted to own it outright, and I wanted to. Um, have nobody tell me what to do. A huge part of my life is I just don't want anyone to tell me what to do so I can make ethical decisions um, for myself. Um, so I didn't take out any loans. I didn't take any kind of foundation money. If I would have called the house art, the foundations uh, would have been throwing money um, at it and it would have been, you know, easier in some ways um, to do so. But I wanted to uh, be free in a certain sense and I think often Free money is gold, can be golden handcuffs, um, and I wanted to, you know, just kind of do that on my do that on my own. Um, nobody can take away. Nobody can take it away. Um, I suppose the city can if I don't pay my taxes or something. But um, <laughs> um, I also wanted to change myself by building a house um, and become the kind of person that I wanted to be become, um, and changing. Uh, excuse me, building the house did change me. I lived without heat for two years uh, in Detroit winters, which were almost two years, um, which was a huge, huge deal. I found something inside myself that was uh, very real and very 
Um, I, it, it was a hard time. It was, <laughs> I mean, I don't know why, it was, it was difficult, but I found some things that um, I didn't know I had or were buried so deeply that um, I wasn't able to access them. Can you talk a little bit about the community in Detroit that, that helped you through this? Because you, that's a big focus of the book when you first moved to Detroit, and as you're building the house, um, your neighbors, uh, being a white guy in a city that's traditionally, it's still 80% black today, um, which is the reverse of the suburbs. The suburbs in Metro are 80% white. Um, and so just the community you came into, the people that you encountered, things along those lines. So Detroit is the most uh, racially segregated metro area in the United States uh, by far. Um, and, you know, I'm like a young white guy with an education uh, moving in there. Obviously, I have a lot more privilege than a whole lot of people um, that live in Detroit. Um, not just my skin color, but education, uh, background, uh, things like that. Um, and. I, there is a persistent myth in Detroit that Detroit is like this kind of blank slate um, where because the city is half empty, they forget about the other half, right? Um, so people always, or often, excuse me, want to come in and, and, and start changing things. Um, I like Detroit how it was, and that was kind of honestly how I thought um, when I was moving in that, you know, I'm going to save Detroit. I'm going to save the city. This is the city that's kind of loomed over my childhood, um, and I'm going to use my, like, well-read 21-year-old white kid education to save, you know, save that. Um, and what I found was something very different, that um, kind of America, American popular culture, and uh, capitalism to a large extent left Detroit. Um, and in that vacuum, people created um, a very distinct culture. I call it radical neighborliness um, in the city where people look out for one another, people say hello um, to one another. It's like the opposite of New York City where you walk, wander around and people won't look you in the eye and nobody wants to say hi. Um, where people have done some pretty stunning things uh, for me uh, to help me along. Um, I was lucky enough to find um, a number of different kind of uh, flavors, I call them, um, of people um, that wanted to just be left alone and kind of do their own thing and raise their children and live their lives how they wanted to. Uh, in the book, I call uh, one of these places Forestdale, which was started by uh, one of the finest men I've ever met. His name is Paul Wirtz. He was a teacher at the Catherine Ferguson Academy, which was a school for pregnant and parenting mothers. His idea 20, 30 years ago was to teach the young women to um, raise their children um, by first raising plants and animals. So there was a working farm on the grounds of the school that was enormous. I forget how many acres it was, but it was stunning. They had like horses and cows, um, dozens of beehives and fruit trees, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, and he also kind of started this block, although it wasn't intentional, um, with uh, other kind of like-minded folks where they would bale hay um, for the horses and, and chickens and cows at the, um, at the school. This is, you can walk baseball stadium from here and bailing hay in Detroit, it's wild to think about. Um, but it's also pretty smart too. Um, so one of the folks that I uh, respect and um, liked quite a bit was Grace Lee Boggs, who was kind of, I call Detroit's patron saint of change. She was a philosopher in like the old school sense. Um, <coughs> excuse me, and there is now a, a bog school. She has recently passed away. Um, uh, what I found was a very strong, interesting community in a way that um, I don't think exists anywhere else in the, in the United States. Um, and the city wasn't blank. And I guess uh, the way I put it in the book was I wanted to add my voice to the chorus rather than overwrite that or be the, be the soloist. I'm curious how you think Detroit has changed now since you wrote the book, and, and you mentioned these things uh, during the course of the book, the changes that you see in the city, but uh, there is development downtown now, there's development in some of the neighborhoods, um, some of it is publicly funded, some of it's privately funded. Um, how do you look at development now, and, and how have things changed in your neighborhood and in Detroit uh, since you, you wrote the book, and is it for better or for worse? You know, as we talked about earlier, I think it's a mixed bag. Um, so we are losing some things with this development. Um, and obviously, we're, we're, we're gaining the obvious, obvious ones, you know, jobs, economics, um, and such. Um, I think that development has been rather uneven 
in terms of race. I think most of that development is going to a very few neighborhoods, uh, specifically Midtown and Downtown, and that uh, money isn't making its way out to the neighborhoods uh, where I live and where you live. Um, I call it trickle-down urbanism. Um, because the, the idea is that kind of if we fix the city center, then that those that that will trickle down. Um, if it works like trickle down econ economics, I don't think that's um, a great uh, idea. I think the kind of poster child for this is just a week after Detroit declared bankruptcy. It was the largest municipal bankruptcy in United States history. Um, we gave. Um, more than $350 million to Mike Gillich, who was a billionaire, to build a new hockey stadium. Um, so there was no money, but we could, we could find $350 million to give this already very wealthy person um, money to build a hockey stadium. Uh, the question I ask is, what would happen if we gave out you know, $700 half million dollar small business grants and loans? That would make the city look be very, very different with 700 new small businesses in the city. Um, I think that we're repeating some of the mistakes of the past. I don't think uh, race gets talked about enough, especially in the, the most racially segregated metro area in the US, where literally Detroit is more than 80% black and the suburbs are the reverse. Um, so I think that uh, you know it's hopeful to see what's going on, and I like it. I, I think that we need to be very careful about democracy, though, as well. Um, people like Dan Gilbert, uh, and some of the foundations who are generally doing good things, um, there's no way to vote these people out if we don't like what they're doing. Um, and so that pro present, presents a, a, a large problem for democracy. I mean, everything's going well right now, but if that changes, what is our recourse? I'm curious too, more specifically, as you've seen things in the neighborhood change, so um, does anybody here know the name Hans Bank, Hans Farms at all? Um, so to give you a little bit of background, and you mention uh, this person in the book a little bit, so, um, very shortly after the recession in Detroit, there was uh, a bank that came in and had proposals around buying big plots of land on the city's east side, um, which was Hans Bank and now has a, an organization called Hans Farms. And they, they kind of pop up throughout the book a little bit, but um, have you seen organizations like Hans, uh, which are privately funded organizations interested in buying land on, you know, in neighborhoods, um, have you seen that change your neighborhood, uh, for better or for worse? Um, and, and how do you see that playing out? According to uh, NPR, 20% uh, of the abandoned properties in Detroit are owned by foreigners, basically. So I live next to an abandoned house, uh, like right next to an abandoned house, which I can almost touch from my bedroom window. Um, it, uh, it's now owned by the land bank, but for the first seven years I lived there, it was owned by a limited liability corporation, uh, and I could not find who was behind, who, because of how the laws are structured. I couldn't find out who actually owns it. I couldn't get to a person on the end of that. Um, you know, that, that house is being kept as an investment. I would have preferred to, um, to fix that up and put my cousin in it or rent it out or house a family of refugees, which is the current idea. Um, but I couldn't because, uh, you know, somebody was trying to make money from that. If that house burns down, my house is going to go with it. It's probably going to kill my dog. Um, so I think we're seeing a lot of speculation um, that may be good for an individual's pocketbook, but is not necessarily good for the neighborhood. I think this is one of the flip sides of development. And this attention is attracting a lot of attention. Um, and people are saying, I can make money from that. Um, in terms of Hans Farms, I, I, it's, I, it's a little bit more complicated than that, because Hans lives in town. Um, uh, you know, he's a banker. Um, he's, you know, he's never grown anything living. Originally, his idea uh, was to come to my neighborhood, actually. I live in uh, Pole Town, uh, which is near Eastern Market. It's like the borders Eastern Market. And they wanted to do vegetables. Um, that switched. They're now doing a hardwood tree farm. Um, and by all accounts, they've cleaned up the neighborhood. Uh, the neighbors over there really seem to, really seem to love it. I've talked to some of them myself, and they're really into it, which is kind of in terms of development what I what I go by. Um, many other people think it's a, a, a land grab, uh, very simply, um, a way they got the land very inexpensively in a way that like s someone small time like me or my neighbors uh, don't have access to. Um, 
And so we'll see, you know, time will tell. Uh, they were going to do vegetables, and now they're doing hardwood trees to, you know, cut them down someday and sell them for, sell them for money. And, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, there, there are a lot of promises that uh, we just won't know. Um, yeah. But looking at American history, those promises don't always seem to uh, bear out for those that don't, um, that don't have much to begin with. Pivoting a little bit from Detroit, I want to talk about two things, and I also want to open up to the audience in a little bit. But um, one of the things, I think, on a lighter note, uh, what because a lot of the places in the beginning of the book and even through the end, you talk about just like places that are special to you in Detroit, bars that you would write in, and, and things like that. So, what are some of the places um, that kind of you've become accustomed to or, or you're a regular at in Detroit? Uh, for folks that are interested in, in visiting and, and getting to know the city at a deeper level? I'm uh, somewhat of a recluse, uh, so I, don't, I, I only go to a few places anymore. You don't have to give away. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, I'd be happy to. Uh, so the, the place I generally write at is called Trina Sos. It's a coffee house in Easter Market. Um, it's owned by a man named Joel Peterson and a, wo a woman named Re Rebecca Matsai, who have been great patrons of the, of the arts in Detroit for a long time. Uh, they're wonderful people. It's very much a hub of, of culture and writing um, and rather, rather diverse, which I look for. Um, as we talked about earlier, the DIA is just an absolute gem. Um, the D, there's, it is just an absolutely world-class museum. They always have events going on. There's always something to do. There's the main collection is great. There, I just can't say enough good things about the DIA and the DFT, the Detroit Film Theater. Um, and when I drink, which is rarely anymore, I drink in Hamtramck. Hamtramck is a great place to go, uh, bar because it's only two square miles. You can walk to all of them, um, and they all have a little bit different flavor, but they're all like pretty much dive bars. Yeah, they're That's they're great. all uh, <laughs> they're all good. So I do that. I you know spend a lot of time at time at home now. My other question before I, I kick it over to the audience is uh, around technology. And you are by no means a Luddite. You have a website. You are on social media. You're on, on various platforms. Um, but the book talks a lot about you know physical work, um, being involved in disconnecting a little bit. So I'm wondering how you balance those things in your personal life a little bit. Um, because you're a writer, you're connected a lot. And, and how do you balance you know working on a house and doing that? or, or living your life in a certain way with the values that you, you talked about in the book? So I don't have the internet at my house. I don't keep the internet at my house. Um, it makes me read, right? Um, right, yeah. <laughs> right. right. Um, I just got, I was never allowed to watch TV when I was a kid. I just got my first TV like a week ago. I'm like super stoked. Uh, uh, yeah. I just, I watched the first season on DVD. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, for my own sanity, I need to disconnect a little bit because I have to use the internet for work. I'm like Twitter and Facebook is a, not only a promotional tool for me, but also kind of in, informational gathering. Um, and to, you know, just have these nightmares beamed into your eyes by like something you keep in your pocket all day is I, I need to be able to disconnect from. Um, and I, I, I think there's nothing like physical work. There is no sense I, I mean, maybe I, I, I don't know maybe maybe it would be interesting to see I've never you know written a program or, or, or coded anything where you know you can turn it on and it works right for me there's nothing like turning the key in a car that doesn't work and then having that engine roar to life right it's it's very immediate it's very visceral um, and I haven't found any way to replace that. Even, even in writing, even having things published, I, I'm on the staff at the Guardian newspaper. Um, doesn't compare to, you know, turning that key and, you know, having that engine come to life. I do think we're losing um, a sense of wildness um, that we talked about a little bit, uh, too. Um, I think the world is becoming less wild, and in some sense that's good. Um, and uh, others were, were kind of, I think, losing some of the values uh, that come with that. One of them is self-sufficiency. I'm very big on, on self-sufficiency. I want to try to be as self-sufficient as possible, which also has its downsides as well, especially when you talk about community and, and, and what that means, what, what it means to be part of a community. But uh, yeah, like I said, there's nothing like turning that key. I've got a thousand questions that I could ask him, but is, uh, is there anybody in the audience that has questions about Detroit, uh, anything in the book? I'm still struck by when you walked into the house, probably for the first time, and saw what sounded like pretty terrible conditions, and you clearly, from what you said, have a lot of love for those around you and your neighbors and, and the city. 
how do you kind of manage that juxtaposition of the conditions you walked into in the home hmm. and whatever people had kind of created that with sure. the way you feel generally about your, your surrounding neighbors? You know, like a, an interesting conversation I often think about is like scrappers, like people scrapping these places out, right? Um, so oftentimes these houses will get burned down for the copper. Um, uh, or, or you know, the, the copper wires and the copper pipes will be ripped out. Um, it's hard for me to, like, hate on that, you know, because, like, people have no other option. This is what, like, folks are doing to survive. And, you know, nobody's making a profit. Nobody's getting rich off that, right? Um, they're just trying to feed their family or themselves or, or, or whatever. I, what troubles me is, um, I guess, on the, you know, governmental level where people are kind of overseeing and looking looking at this, we're demolishing incredible amounts of houses. I, f I forget how many it is a day, but it's like a dozen a day or something, uh, like 10,000 over the last year. Um, and to me, that seems like a staggering waste of resources, right? Um, I think that we could f kind of harvest many of the things in these houses, um, which would be better for the environment. Uh, you know, we could use that to build the new housing stock in the city that we obviously need, and we could provide people lots of jobs. Uh, what I'm fearing is the loss of creativity in how we how we how we do stuff um, like that. So I could look at a house that was filled with trash and say, like, okay, we can do this. Like, it's not a big deal. It also kept me out of trouble, right? Um, so I didn't waste my 20s in like a cloud of marijuana smoke and like cat videos, right? Like, I knew I would have something that <laughs> that that would always keep me busy. But like, when I didn't have a job or if I couldn't have a job. Um, I would always have something to do and something to work on. Um, so I think we could use a little more uh, imagination, and I think imagination is absolutely essential, which is why when we see you know, art programs and music programs being removed from schools, um, it's, it's troubling, because who's gonna create you know, the next things of the, of, the, of the future, so. Do you feel like a sense of listlessness from having like, finished the house and the project is done? I, I do somewhat. So I've, I've, uh, you, the house is not totally finished. I'll probably be working on the house the rest of my life, right? Um, it's very nice now. Like I live, you know, I live there, and it's very comfortable. And I have two bathrooms, and you know, a guest bedroom, and stuff like that. Um, so that's nice. And like finishing a big project like a book, I do. I've spent ten years in Detroit. Um, I was uh, recently awarded a Kresge Foundation grant, uh, so I have to be in the city for a year um, for that. And um, after that, I, I'm, I may uh, move to Europe. Uh, to Scandinavia or you know northeastern Europe uh, because I want to see the opposite side of things where we have public transportation and things work well and socialism um, just generally so I do I think I need some new inspiration uh, just personally but Detroit is always my my will always be my home you know I, I I don't know how many generations my family goes back in Michigan we've been here for a long time my whole extended family lives here um, so I'll never really leave uh, but yeah, I don't think I want to build another house right now. Um, if I could, people ask me this, and I say, you know, if I could be 22 years old again, for sure I'd do it. But um, you know, I'm getting old. It's hard on your body. Um, I, I'm looking at my father and grandfather and uncles. I'm the oldest male member of my family, aside from an uncle, with all of my fingers intact. I haven't cut any of my fingers off yet. Um, so there are like real consequences to these, and kind of breathing all the stuff. Um, that I, I did it once and I proved I could do it uh, to myself and you know my family and uh, you know if the if the uh, opportunity comes up I'm attempting to buy the house next door to me still um, and if I'm able to do that the plan is I'll do it with my father and in the lower apartment uh, we'll rent it out at market rate uh, you know like hipsters or whatever and get as much money for it as we can and uh, yeah, <laughs> And which will support, uh, we'd like to house a refugee family um, in the top, uh, you know, free of cost so they can kind of get on their feet, supported by um, the market rate apartment. Can you, can you talk a little bit about buying a house in Detroit? I mean, so when the book kicks off, you're describing the process of buying the house at the auction in, in 2008. It was, sure. you're flipping through pages uh, and, and trying to do that. So that that versus what it is today and how that's changed things and changed the market and changes the neighborhood. Sure. So yeah, so the, when I purchased my house, it was at a live auction. I had like a bidder card that I used uh, to purchase this house. Um, it is done online today, which uh, 
kind of has an interesting ethical um, ethical um, segment to it. As so, I think it's forty percent of Detroiters don't have access to the internet, whether uh, like on a computer or on their phones. Like have absolutely no access to the internet. Um, there is a serious issue with uh, internet literacy in Detroit as well um, that people are working on and trying to change. But uh, it. Cr Having the having the auction online creates a huge power imbalance, right, between people who are savvy with the internet and you know have the time and, and resources to do that and figure those things out, and those that don't. So, for example, um, the neighbors behind me I only have two neighbors. They're an elderly family. The gentleman is a little senile, and he was taking care of all the bills. Um, but uh, the, the the woman in the house was was running things, and their house uh, was up for foreclosure. Um, and the auction was online. The, these people are you know, 80 years old, have owned this house for 30 years and owned it outright, um, and are all of a sudden facing being thrown out on the street. Uh, one, another neighbor of mine and I uh, ended up purchasing the house for them. You know, with them paying us back, there was somebody bidding against us, they would have um, you know, thrown my neighbors out. Um, so these things that uh, are often looked at as unallied goods um, can have, you know, you know, their tools. Uh, we, th we we tend to think of tools as uh, inert or, or just what they are, but they can have these un unintended consequences of you know this family not being able to um, uh, even begin to understand how to purchase this house back, uh, uh, their own house, back on the internet. You know, when my neighbor and I are bidding against. You know, so I foiled the, the guy, you know, who's buying dozens of properties that day. Yeah, and as a just side note, the, you have to put a $2,000 deposit down online to buy a house. So that there's a barrier to entry even if you want to buy a house in the city. The, the, the amount of structural poverty is staggering. Um, is, you know, until you really see it with like people living without water. The one in six homes has been shut off to water. One in four houses has been foreclosed upon. Um, and lots, you know, like when you see people living without water and electricity, and like in America, it's 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 not only heartbreaking but mind blowing. It's 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 wild um, that we allow allow these things to go on. So even two thousand dollars is completely unreachable for many people. Looking at like the uh, housing market now in Detroit, sure. um, I'm sure that's like rising. Um, would you say that it will be hard for, say, a Googler like us to get in and purchase? And if so, like, you know, what is that rate comparing to, if, if you have any background in that? Oh, sure. I mean, there are definitely, I mean, you know, there are incredible deals. Like, if you want to live in Detroit, buy a house there right now. You can probably buy it with what's in your savings. Um, you know, like, $500 houses are, like, not, there's not a whole lot of them. Um, the housing market is rising rapidly, but if you want to purchase a house and like become part of the community, um, absolutely, go for it. Do it tomorrow um, because the, those prices are going up consistently. I do always tell people, you know, um, there's a huge difference in buying a property to to make money for yourself. You know, like kind of be, become some absentee landlord. Like, you know, the way I put it is that like we want things to flourish in Detroit, but we want them to have roots. So I get a lot of people calling me like, hey, help me buy like some investment properties there. It's like, no, nah, man, that's not what I'm about. I want a good, strong community. I want to know my neighbors. I want to, you know, like have people over for dinner. Um, if you're trying to do that, like do it now. Um, get in right now. Um, and people will accept you. I mean, it's, it's amazing that uh, people in Detroit uh, you know, people in Detroit just want equality. They're not asking for revenge, um, which is, is, I think, a huge credit to people. And people like me, who are young and white and like look different than many people, have largely been accepted um, to Detroit's enormous, enormous credit. Um, so if you want, I would, if you want to do it, do it now. And there's, uh, there's a couple different tracks in terms of buying a house. So you bought it from the auction which you can do online now. There's the Detroit Land Bank that has houses that usually start around 1,000 that they auction off, but there's requirements in place. Whereas if you buy it a certain way, you could spend a lot of time fixing it up as you did. If you buy it through the land bank, you have to, they, you have to meet certain criteria and threshold to have your house up to date by certain days or they can take it back. So they're trying to get people, and you can't, you know, you have to be a Michigan resident and things like that. They're trying to get people to fix houses up um, on a timeline instead of saying, 
like, oh, we'll just sit on these houses for 20 sure. years uh, sort of thing and not invest any money in them. You can still get a really nice house for like $20,000. Yeah, yeah, know? absolutely, yeah. And have a place to live and, and, and be and like kind of, you know, have a part. And it feels good living there a lot of the time because you can have an actual impact and an actual direction on, on what people go. And, and, you know, I'm a big proponent of buying houses because like for myself, it keeps people someplace. I think what people are scared of in Detroit, including myself, is and, and this used to happen more often than it does now, um, was, you know, people would come in, very smart, educated people would come in from the Ivy League universities and spend a year in Detroit and make decisions that they weren't around to see the consequences of, right? So I think people in Detroit and myself, you know, are, are, everybody makes mistakes and like we all, we all have to get along, but if you just make decisions that affect my life and then leave for New York or San Francisco or whatever, I understand everybody's got to go, but there was a deluge of it. And it was also people that had so much more societal power than the average Detroiter. Um, I think what people want, including myself, is people to come and be part of the community, you know? And, you know, I want to know, you know, we've never met, but mm -hmm. I'll, we'll be neighbors for yeah. a long time. Um, and you treat people in a different way when that happens, I think. Mm -hmm. I think there is another question. You can go. Oh. Uh, so my question was, are there any organizations that you feel like provide especially good opportunities for people from different backgrounds to kind of mingle uh, and see, you know, get a better understanding of what it's like for real people. Sure. Um, I think that we could use more of them. Um, one of my favorites is um, the Allied Media Conference, which is a little bit off the radar. I think they're absolutely brilliant there um, and really know what they're, they're talking about. Uh, but I think the large cultural institutions in the city do that. Places like the DIA, the Detroit Film Theater, the Detroit Historical Society, the Charles Wright Museum, which is the African American History Museum. Um, I think they do a, the, really, honestly, the best the best job of this. Um, I think people are really trying trying to like work on how to do this. Um, but we don't know anymore. We're, I feel like in, a, in Detroit, we're kind of building from scratch. I mean, I did not. There was you know ten years ago. There was no place I can go. I could go in Detroit where there would be only white people, and that is completely different now. Um, I think people care about it, and I think people are trying to figure it out. But we're not quite there yet. I, I think the the motives and intentions are good, but we re really don't know. Um, we're, that's like an active question we're trying to figure out. Um, and I think the large cultural institutions are, are are really doing that the best. I would also say neighborhood groups. So yeah. if you are interested in a particular area or neighborhood in Detroit, figure out when their community meetings are and just go to one. Like that's it's the best way to meet people from the community and see kind of the diversity and people from different walks of life all in one place. I, the, the neighborhood I live in has one once a month, and I meet new people every single time I go. And it's that's been outside of the cultural institutions probably the biggest place for me is just. And that's the thing, a lot of neighborhoods in Detroit still don't have something like that. That's a disparity between neighborhoods. It's folks have organized in some ways and have a nonprofit or something that's an organizing force, and then some neighborhoods don't have that yet. So and that is a whole imbalance of like the neighborhoods that might get developed versus not, is do you have someone speaking for your voice in the city? You know, people are friendly too. People are just straight up friendly there. Um, and like just saying hello, this is something that uh, kind of cultural icon Marsha Music uh, talks about a lot um, with, you know, like white folks uh, coming in. It's just like, just say hi, you know, go say hi to people. It's, it's like a simple thing, but it, it doesn't always, we've gotten away from that in our society, I think, you know. So you said that you wanted to add your voice to the chorus. Sure. So are there other authors or artists or activists that you would recommend uh, we check out if we're interested in learning more about Detroit? Certainly. Um, one one of my favorite artists in there is named uh, is a sound artist or like musician. His name is Sterling Tolls, like Detroit underground techno. Just came out with a, a wonderful album called uh, Resurgent Cenerbus. Um, Sterling's a generational Detroiter. Um, a fascinating, brilliant man. Um, Marsha Music is another one who is also a writer um, in the city that is um, absolutely brilliant, also a generational Detroiter. Um, oh, who else? Uh, 
So I think uh, I mentioned Trina Soaps. I would totally start there. Uh, uh, this is another one of one of these places, a coffee house in Easter Market, where a lot of the artists and, and writers uh, hang out. Um, that you can see, so the master musicians of Jujuka, uh, the oldest band in the world, uh, when they came to the United States, uh, they played Bonnaroo Music Festival, they played the Kennedy Center, and they played Trina Sofs. Um, so uh, that's, that's, another, um, that's another good one. There's the Belt Magazine is publishing the Detroit Neighborhood Guidebook uh, on the 24th, uh, I think, is the release party at Signal Return, in, also in Eastern Market. Um, oh, who else? And that's uh, Aaron Foley uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is the writer of that book. So if you haven't checked him out, uh, Aaron Foley. Yeah, because yeah. he, he wrote a book called How to Live in Detroit and Not Be a Jackass, which <laughs> is definitely uh, a good read if you're thinking about moving to Detroit. Sure. <laughs> in terms of visual art, Tiff, uh, Tiff Massey uh, is a like, jewelry, jewelry designer, um, amongst other things. She's just incredible. I mean, there's a lot of, of underground talent. I tell people, if you want to be an artist, like if you're an emerging artist, Detroit is absolutely the best place to live in, in the United States, because it's inexpensive, uh, because you can have space and materials are available, uh, but also because there is just an incredible artistic community happening there, um, just bursting with ideas and discussions and um, you know, like I said, like a coffee house, like Trina Sofs, like you can walk in there, if you've been in town long enough, know every single person in there and just have a discussion about, you know, with a map maker um, who's, who's mapping the racial politics of Detroit, you know, next to, uh, you know, somebody who's making, uh, you know, Afrocentric, Afrofuturistic jewelry, you know, next to somebody who's like Adrienne Marie, Marie Brown, who is, uh, you know, writing Afrofuturism stories in the vein of Oct Octavia Butler um, that are becoming very popular, so. It seems like an inhibitor to moving to Detroit and setting up rooms in the school system also, because people have family. Sure. Sure. Um, the school system is trash, obviously. Um, and I do see people, uh, younger folks with kids, um, s starting to stay. That was always the big thing. Like, that was the kind of tipping point for where the city was. If you had kids, did you stay? Uh, people are starting to figure it out, and that, that's almost exclusively in private and charter schools. Um, there are some public charters, like the Grace Lee Boggs School, uh, which is right next to me, which I am a huge proponent of. Um, uh, that does a really good job. They do place-based education, which uh, they use like the challenges and resources in the neighborhood to teach their students about being good community citizens. Um, so yeah, it's, it's still a question, but people, I definitely see people beginning to figure this question out. Uh, another one is the, uh, the Waldorf School. Lots of, uh, lots of my friends send their children to the Waldorf School there. Um, and it is happening. I don't think, unfortunately, it's happening. Just, just the real politic, like not really happening in the Detroit public schools yet. Um, and to be honest, I don't really see a path out of it yet. Do we have time for one more? You had yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned like the techno scene, and I was just curious what you feel the impact, whether good or bad, something like down here. Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's great. People come from all over the world to see, you know, in, in, in Germany and Belgium, it's called Detroit music, right? Um, we invented it. It's one of our, you know, cultural icons, and I, th I think actually we could do a whole lot more to support uh, electronic music in Detroit. And I mean, it's a big, huge deal, and it and it came from here. I, I think I, I I'm not a huge electronic music fan myself, but I can I have enormous respect for someone that can take the noises of the factory, and create this like beautiful thing out of it. Like that's so human to me to 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 to, to take this kind of mechanical. Um, inhuman thing and like make make something beautiful out of it. Um, I actually think in Detroit we could do a whole lot more um, to support that. There's kids like Kyle Hall, um, uh, who is another like Detroit artist you might want to check out that you know will play to you know 20 people at Motor City Wine Bar and then we'll fly to Berlin and play to 20,000 people. Um, for real. <laughs> I think the city's getting a little bit better in terms of recognizing things. Like, I mean, we're just getting <coughs> the Motown Museum, which was literally just a house, and now they're building an actual, like, sure. full-on museum over there. Um, but yeah, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of yeah. 
recognizing music history, cultural history in the city. And we're starting to, you know, yeah. like it's getting it's getting better. And I hope electronic music, and, you know, techno is, is is really something. I mean, like Carl Craig and Carl Cox are like still around, <laughs> you know, like you can, like see them at the bar. This is like legend, you know. It's like seeing Jimi Hendrix at the bar. Like, um, so yeah, I hope they. I, I hope I think we could do a better job of it actually, and I would like to see that um, celebrated even more. Cool. Well. If there's no more audience questions, thank you, Drew, for coming. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.